here to introduce the speaker. Um, she is a human capital optimization and organizational efficiency strategist. Black Belt certified in internal communication and employee engagement. Co-founder of Synergy Junction Canada. She's done her MBA in the UK and um, she's our MC for today. She will be speaking on engaging millennials. Please put your hands together in inviting Sureyas Sarf on stage. So I'm going to start out with, uh, with a little bit of a memory test because I know that everybody has had a bit of caffeine. And um, you know, I think we should all be back up to speed by now. Lunch is digested or digesting. And uh, so I just wanted to test your alertness before we actually carry on. So I want to make sure you're as alert as possible for this segment. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to take a look around you and I'm going to ask you to memorize everything in the room that is the color blue. Everything that is blue. And I'm going to give you another five seconds to do this. So five more seconds to memorize everything you can that is blue. Three, two, one. And if I can have a volunteer, that would be great. Who's got the best memory in the room? You've got the best memory in the room? Come on up for me. And what's your name? Shahriyar, um, representing AgroCorp. Uh, so the blue things, if you want me to name them. Well, I'm going to have you close your eyes first because okay. we have to make this fair, right? Okay. And I want you to actually name something that was red. Uh, the carpet. Well done. Nice, nice job. All right. Round of applause there. Thank you. Why did we actually do that? So the, sh the focus of today has been all about millennials. It's been about how to actually figure out where this generation is in terms of their thought process, what kinds of technology they're leveraging, now it's about actually turning the focus inward. So rather than simply focusing on that one group, we want to actually now start to look at what's actually happening within our organizations, where these millennials are actually starting to become a larger part of our workforce, and how do we actually look at the rest of the infrastructure? So in terms of the processes, in terms of some of the, the leadership attitudes, the way that we actually manage these millennials, how do we actually make use of this talent in the most efficient way? And I'm going to start with the staggering statistic. That 70% of Fortune 1000 companies from 10 years ago no longer exist. It's a little bit shocking. And if we think about what this means to our future, we need to recognize that in the future, it's been predicted that at least 40% of Fortune 1000 companies today will not exist 10 years from now. Think about what that means. If we're looking at a 40 to 60% success rate, this basically means that it's going to be a survival of the fittest type environment and that any company that is not agile in terms of its processes is actually pretty much doomed. I'm going to give you another staggering statistic. 70% seems to be the, uh, the lucky number of the day. But managers account for as much as 70% variance in employee engagement scores. Think about that for a second. When we look at what's actually happening at a managerial level, many times we see that managers are actually recruited on the basis of technical expertise. They're recruited because they're good at what they do in their technical functions. So a finance manager will have finance skills. A marketing manager will know his marketing stuff. Across each different function, we don't actually hire management on the basis of their people management skills. This, again, is very staggering. It's simply because if they're managing an entire workforce and that is the glue that binds our strategy to what's actually happening within the company, we have a slight problem there. So we're starting to notice that leadership development has become pretty major. 
And anybody who's been a coach or a consultant can probably vouch for the fact that that makes up a pretty large portion of their business, leadership development. But again, it's about looking at how we actually approach these strategies. It's about looking at how we enable our managers to enable others. Because these are the actual decision makers within the firms. So when we have new talent, when we have innovation, when we're bringing in new processes or looking at new things, doing new things in different ways, it's this particular line of individuals who are the decision makers and who are going to be either supporting it or who are going to be the naysayers. And this is where it's absolutely crucial to make sure that our business strategy is absolutely aligned with sustainability strategy, with communication strategy, with engagement strategy, with innovation strategy, and with diversity strategy. In fact, it's not even a matter of alignment anymore. It's a matter of connection and interdependency. Because these used to be typically different strategies. We would hire, usually, a different communications manager and a different diversity and inclusion manager. These strategies actually need to be synonymous. They need to be a cut and paste version of what the actual business strategy is. And they need to be actually modified to fit When we come down to communication strategy, communication strategy is the glue that, that also binds all of these strategies together. So it's important to basically make sure that we understand, we've made it clear for our management in order to make it clear for their people. How our managers communicate on a strategic level is something that has to be the foundational element of a corporate culture. Let's look at corporate culture for a second, though. Corporate culture comes in right after we're able to provide the clarity around an organization's identity, purpose, and vision. So if we're looking at this from a strategic angle, essentially what we need to do is we need to make sure that that purpose and that vision is clearly articulated from the top in a way in which it translates to behaviors right down to the bottom. Think about this for a moment and let this settle in, because the alignment portion of this starts to become the tricky piece. And the reason why it's a tricky piece is because all of our managers have different leadership styles. They have different traits. They have different priorities, in fact. And they have different habits. Keyword habits. The organizational habits that are perpetuated by these managers form what we call the culture, support what we call the strategy, become the commitment of each individual on their team. It drives the incentives, it drives the goals, and it drives the metrics. So when we're aligning our management, we want to make sure that not only are they aligned with the strategy, but th that they're also aligned with each other. And the reason this is, is because if they are aligned with each other, they're all speaking the same language. They're all doing the same things. They're all perpetuating the same behaviors. And that's when you get a consistent corporate culture. We're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about agility, because I think that in terms of the, the millennial mindset and in terms of being able to leverage the talent that exists, we've talked a little bit about what that means from an exponential organization's perspective. We've talked about what that means from a media perspective. We've looked at the technologies that are contributing to agility. But what I want to talk to you about in terms of agility are the enablers and the disablers. Agility has to be deeply rooted in process. When we look at the IBMs of today who are implementing agility on the spot for projects, we're seeing that there's literally a two-hour time frame of turnaround from when somebody is given feedback to when it is actually implemented. That two-hour time frame 
enables people on projects to get things done much faster, to change course much faster, but it also requires that there's a specific agility-based mindset. Because if these processes take any longer than that, or are discouraged by somebody who doesn't believe in the power of experimentation, again, we face another downfall. We face a disabling factor rather than an enabling factor. Now, in this context, we've got to look at what's actually going on in our environments. It's great to be able to say, you know what, it's ideal to support innovation. We have all this millennial talent. We want to leverage all of this technology. We want to leverage the new ways of doing things. That's all fine and great. But we've got to understand that the majority of the decision makers that are behind these ideas or making decisions on these ideas to move forward, by power of association, are already set in their ways. The majority of the decision makers are not millennials. Ah, what does that mean? That means that there's probably going to be a translation problem. That means that when an idea actually comes forward, it's probably going to take a really good imagination to be able to get into the head of the person that's actually putting forth that idea. That means that we've got to drop our preconceived notions of how we've always done things or the way we do things around here, which tends to be a major stifling factor for a lot of corporates. And it's easier said than done. Many corporates have what we call an innovation team where they'll bring together a bunch of product developers and say, OK, you guys come up with a new product. Innovation even works in a very different way with the millennial crowd than it does previously, tra traditionally rather. Traditionally, we leave these teams to come up with what, whatever innovation they want on a, on a product or service level. And these tend to be incremental. They're incremental innovations because of the fact that a lot of these people have been working on these things for ages. They've been in the industry for years, in the same industry for years. That's great from an experience perspective, but from an innovation perspective, it's not great at all. And the reason being because incremental innovation doesn't take us too far these days. Disruptive innovation does. And how do you get disruption? Well, you get disruption from diversity. How do you get diversity? You get diversity from making sure that you've got a huge, a plethora of talent on your team. You've got different backgrounds on your team. You've got people who might have graduated with anthropology and sports medicine and you know, a number of different fields all at one table to be able to innovate on one particular product, which may not even be part of their field. But you're getting opinions and you're getting thought processes come through from different individuals from all walks of life. And that's what's contributing to industry divergence. When you converge technologies, when you're able to pull things from, for example, the mobile technology field, and you're able to pull things from, let's say, renewable energy and put them together and come up with a mobile app that measures your energy consumption. That's industry convergence. And that's where things are going. We're not going to actually get much convergence by sticking to the same teams. So it's also a matter of management being able to vet out when it's time to change things up a little bit. Because you only get different outcomes when you do different things. I'm going to talk to follow through and execution for a moment. And earlier, um, Dr. Francisco had mentioned that it's very difficult to implement strategy when you have consultants implementing it for you. It's never a one-size-fits-all approach. And in fact, many of the companies that have dealt with some of the biggest consulting firms have faced many issues when the consulting firms are ready to phase out and when they need to champion their own strategy internally. And to this I say, trust your people. Trust your people and build cross-functional teams from a cross-section of the organization. Senior, junior, 
and across multiple functions. And the reason I say this is because these are your change champions. These are the people that know your business the best. These are the individuals who can actually make things happen. The difficulty here is that you've also got to look at how things are being framed. And when you have leadership that are able to take the suggestions that are coming through and reframe them to senior management, not as a problem, but as a solution, this is actually when we start to see a little bit more traction in innovation, see a bit more traction in product development, see a bit more traction in strategic implementation. Your people know best. Have it facilitated. In terms of being able to track that value, in terms of being able to look at how performance is actually managed thereafter, things are changing drastically on that front as well. We're moving towards a model in which many Fortune 500s have ditched the, the traditional performance management mechanisms. Why? Because nobody wants to be rated anymore. Nobody wants to be told, you're a three on a scale of five. What does that actually do to the psyche? Ah, every time performance management rolls around, we know that there's going to be a dip in engagement. In fact, many of the firms that I've worked with have said, we're not doing our engagement surveys until at least three months after performance management cycles because we know that it's going to be affected negatively and we want to make sure that that's out of the way and forgotten before we actually start to measure anything. Kind of defeats the purpose of measurement. I see some smiles, so you definitely know what I'm talking about. But at the same time, we've got to recognize that performance management is also, it's also funny in the sense that it's kind of like a report card that you get at school. When you get a report card at the end of the year, what good is it? And so what's replacing it is constant feedback. Developing a feedback culture is what's replacing traditional performance management. And when we look at developing a feedback culture, we've got to actually stop to say, well, what's driving this feedback culture? And again, it comes back to leadership communication. It comes back to how are we equipping our people to ask better questions so that we can get them better answers? How are we equipping our people with the comfort to ask for feedback? Are we creating an environment which is safe to ask for feedback? And again, a lot of these come back to corporate culture. A lot of it comes back to how are we instituting the processes? What kind of habits are we asking our managers to come out with or to display as role models for these millennials, for all staff? The other purpose of me ha uh, having you look at whatever was blue in the room and then asking you to focus on a different color was because we also have to address the multi-generation aspect. We do have millennials, but if we focus too much on the millennials, we're going to have a bit of a problem engaging the rest. So we've got to figure out where is that sweet spot where we can actively engage every single generation all at once. And this is becoming a bit more of a challenge because engagement happens through different media all the time. You might find that certain millennials prefer electronic media, they prefer the intranet, they prefer um, you know, social media, some of them are on Yammer, some of them are on Slack, some of them are, you know, they prefer using um, you know, Instagram. We've got to scale it back and look at what's the common denominator and then build from there, just so that we make sure that we're building in multi-generational engagement tools. Again, it's really about the cross-functional collaboration. It's really about making sure that these people are so well integrated that they're actually pulling the other generations ahead with them, rather than being pulled back. So I would say articulate a vision. 
And the vision doesn't need to be complex. It doesn't need to be long. It doesn't need to contain your entire business strategy. In fact, I'll give you an, an example of HP's vision, which is imagine the future and make it happen. It's something so simple, but has percolated throughout HP in such a short amount of time that it's become the driving slogan behind every single project that they put out. When you align your management, make sure that not only are they aligned to the strategy, but that they're aligned with each other. That cross-functionally, you have an idea of what kind of management and what kind of culture you want them to be able to replicate throughout the organization as key conduits of engagement. And last but not least, rather than ensuring engagement, I'm going to invite you to ensure inclusivity, because essentially these are becoming one and the same thing. When we look at inclusivity from a neurological angle, we start to see that when we're exclusive, when we exclude individuals, it actually creates the same force or the same activity in the brain as physical pain. Think about that for a second. When we exclude somebody, when somebody feels ignored, they don't feel like they belong, in the brain, it lights up just like a hammer on your toe. The profundity of that statement will take you very far because it will remind us to make sure that we're including at every point of the game, at every meeting, in every interaction. And it's very easy to forget to include. It's very easy to forget to provide that sense of belonging. It's very easy to forget to pose the, those right questions that get people feeling like they have certain choices or that they have a certain amount of say in any particular environment. But building that sense of belonging, ensuring that they're feeling like there is equal opportunity across the board, is something extremely crucial not only for millennials, but also rising for everybody across the entire workforce. And in order to get that multi-generational angle, if we follow a certain series of steps, we've now called it the SCARF model. If we follow a certain series of steps, we're able to ensure that each of these elements are actually seen in a reward type way that they light up the, right si the correct sides of the brains in terms of feeling like these are fulfilled rather than feeling like they're not. This is basically a teaser of the SCARF model. We'll go into a little bit more detail for those of you who are joining us at the, at the workshop uh, on Thursday, um, where we'll actually look at the, the deeper science behind the SCARF model. Um, and so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. On that note, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite up some of the panelists who will be joining me for a deeper discussion on how these resonate and how talent can be managed within an organization. So we've spent most of the morning dealing with the external factors. We've, we've discussed a lot of um, you know, what's going on outside of organizations. It's a really great time for us to look at what's happening within our organizations and to look at what actually needs to change? What is best practice across the entire talent management spectrum, from attracting millennials to engaging them to developing them, and even retention strategies that actually empower them to do more and be more so that we can continue to sort of yield the best out of that kind of that particular generation and beyond. Thank you.